Well, good morning everybody. We are in another graveyard. Very small one. And we're here to do the grave of the British Bulldog. I saw the British Bulldog live twice. Once when I was six years old. That's how long, that's how early I got into wrestling. And although I don't watch it as much anymore, I try and keep up to date. Um, it plays such a huge part of my life growing up. And like so many of them, the wrestlers, they passed away stupidly early. And it's one of those graves I've done no research for because I feel like I know a lot. And I'm going to give you what I know. So I hope you enjoy. <laughs> man's in the news a lot at the moment for not good reasons he's recently left the BWF would you believe and not to you know big up a uh, somebody who's obviously done wrong like we all make mistakes but he was a genius and you look at the NBA the NFL um, the NBL and they're all trying to, uh, they've ne recently realized within the last 10 years that America isn't the world and they need to branch out. Um, but Vince McMahon was doing that in the 80s. He first ran a promotion, um, he first ran a tour, I believe in 1989. I'm only saying that through, I'm sure Macho Man versus Hulk Hogan was an event in 1989. He definitely ran one in 1990 because Hulk Hogan, Sergeant Slaughter was the main event. But his grave is just over there. But I don't know if he realised, right, I need to give Hulk Hogan some time off because they worked so much. And he brought back the British Bulldog who'd already worked for WWF in 88. Let me turn you around. He had already worked with WWF in. 1988 and he was fired by well they weren't the British Bulldogs him and his tag team partner Dynamite Kid who was his cousin who also lived in this area they would let go left because of an incident with Jack Rougeau from the Rougeau brothers and he left after Survivor Series 1988 the second annual Survivor Series um, I'm going to walk away because I hate talking at Grizz. So yeah, um, they left. The British Bulldogs were a, a very prominent team in <clears throat> that early wrestling boom. They hit America in the late 80s. Um, they were at WrestleMania 2 with Ozzy Osbourne, if memory serves. And they beat the Dream Team, if I remember. And... They ended up leaving, so WrestleMania 2 would have be been 1987. They left in 1988, November. They went to Japan. But, like I said, Vince McMahon, realising he needed more than America, started running tours in Britain. And British Bulldog came back in 1991. And whereas he was quite a mid-carder, as they say, in America, um, he was main event in Britain and he would headline the shows over here, him and Bret Hart. Bret Hart is my favourite. Um, most people in Europe and outside of America's favourite seems to be Bret Hart. I don't know why. He grabbed the attention more than the American public so much more. He was massive in America but he's everybody's favourite in Europe. Um, and obviously this was kind of culminated in SummerSlam 1992 where it was the main event, one of the greatest matches ever. Um, if you want like a secret tip or match tip, I think it's called Beware of Dog. Bret Hart versus British Bulldog 2. 
uh, at the In Your House, which is better than the Summer Slam match. I think it's on Beware of Dog, but this is not done any reason. <laughs> so yeah, I saw the wrestling in 1991 and 1992. Uh, he fought Earthquake with Andre the Giant came to the ring with him. And on the same card, Rowdy Roddy Piper versus The Undertaker was on there. And I screamed the house down because I thought Rowdy Roddy Piper was going to die. I was five years old. But yeah, wrestling meant so much to me growing up. Summer Sam 1991 is my favourite pay-per-view. Starts off with the British Bulldog in a six-man. Um, but British Bulldog had so many problems with steroids and growth hormones. British Bulldog was such a ahead of his time performer. He um, he was huge. And he could like bench press wrestlers and when you're a kid you don't really think of anything of that. But these wrestlers are like 20 stone and he's picking them up over his head. But he could also do all the acrobatics. He wasn't aerial but he could do the mat wrestling and everything. And um, he never was world champion. He was let go by WWF in 1993. He went to WCW. He was with Sting, so he was main eventing there. He then came back to WWF, and he was part of the Hart Foundation, which was my favourite period of wrestling in 1997. And then the Montreal Screw Job happened, and he went back to WCW. He came back to WWF. So he was back and forth, back and forth so much. So we were in Goldburn, Lancashire, and he and Dynamite Kid, his tag team partner, who has recently passed away the last two years, um, they were in the wrestling school. I'm not overly sure, like I said, I've done no research, but they end up getting hinted, hunted, or they go off to Calgary and they worked for Stampede Wrestling. And Stampede Wrestling was Stu Hart, so the Hart family. And they had their mansion in Calgary. I did a video on, I went there, the Hart House, only four years ago, but we've had COVID in that time. And it feels like 10 years ago. If you think I'm bad at doing videos now, I was awful then. So, yeah, they went to Calgary. He married Bret Hart's sister, Diana. Um, and that's how he became involved in the Hearts. And he was an exceptional performer, really great. I don't know whether he could be trusted enough to ever be given the World Championship strap. He won the Intercontinental Belt off Summers of Bret Hart's Summer Sam 1992. It's also worth noting was the viewership in America is kind of hitting its peak in 87, 88, 89. Um, in my head I've got Summer Slam 1989 doing one of the best, last best buy rates for until the Attitude Era. I think when he won the Intercontinental Belt in 1992 he was not doing too good health wise or substance wise and he didn't have it for very long and this is a time when people had their belts for a long long time he lost it to Shawn Michaels at a Saturday night's main event and quite a drab match if I remember at two of the greatest of all time I just think they would have a decent match they did have a good match that might have been beware of dog actually yeah, they did have a good match um, But he was back and forth between WWF and WCW, and he um, his reliance on sub substances and painkillers grew and grew, and he passed away incredibly early. In 2002, he wasn't even 40. And it's weird when you're a kid and you're watching. I see there's some Smiths over there, and I recognise their names from wrestling history, but I'm not going to focus on them. Um, there he is down there. It's weird when you're watching wrestling when you're a kid, and 
like even Hulk Hogan's leg drop or Stone Cold's stunner you don't think anything of it when you're a kid you do it to your mates but when you're about my age you think every night running up and jumping on your ass that would kill me now I'm old and all these wrestlers they work so much um, more than they do now and I think they are looked after better now and these guys were wrestling every night until they dropped the only way they would get a break is if they got injured and their reliance on painkillers and steroids do not aid to long lives so we lost all of them well so many of the great ones Rick Rude, Mr. Perfect, they all died like Brian Pillman who was in the Heart Foundation died in 1997 and once he died, it kind of like a floodgate everybody started dying, it was so weird I was so into wrestling, it's like every week it felt like somebody else was gone um, and even people that like lived on Macho Man Ultimate Warrior, they've died and they're very young still but such great performers, such great entertainment. They were real life superheroes, they grabbed my attention. I wasn't into Disney, I wasn't into Marvel, I wasn't into Superman, I wasn't into Batman, I was into Bret Hart versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you for all those memories and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you soon.